Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Empty Cloud Monastery. Uh, so we're here for another Sangha panel discussion. Uh, so uh, this evening, uh, we have uh, to my left, Bhante Jayasara, who has been staying with us since the big, actually before Vasa started, and will be staying until the end of Vasa or possibly a little while after. Uh, and uh, my name is Bhante Sirdaso, who I'm here most of the time, uh, so you might be used to me by now. Uh, so this evening we have a Sangha panel discussion on precepts. Uh, so the power of precepts, what's the role of precepts in our practice? What are the different um, quantities and of precepts one can take? How does one relate to them in a skillful way? Uh, and how can they be used as a support to awakening? So before we start on this topic, we can pay homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa yeah, so as mentioned, we'll be speaking a bit about precepts. Uh, and in uh, the Theravada tradition, uh, we have um, several distinct sets of precepts. Uh, so the most basic is the five precepts, uh, which anyone who is really interested in practicing Buddhism uh, as a lay person is uh, expected to follow the five precepts. Uh, then there's the eight precepts, which is commonly followed when one is living in a monastery. Uh, and uh, also sometimes if someone wants to step up their own practice a bit, they might take the eight precepts at home for a day or a week or longer. Uh, commonly on the full moon and new moon, uh, a devoted lay person will, will take the eight precepts for a day. Uh, then there's the 10 precepts, which is usually practiced by people who are uh, either uh, novice monastics, so samaneras and samaneris, so novice monastics. Uh, sometimes the 10 precepts are also followed by uh, people who are technically not ordained, but who are living a, a semi-monastic life. Uh, so for example, the 10 precept mechis in Thailand, the 10 precept Dasa Silamatas in uh, Sri Lanka, the 10 precept Sailes in uh, Burma. Um, so these are all people who are technically lay people, but who wear official looking outfits and follow the 10 precepts. Uh, and then once one becomes fully ordained, uh, one is following hundreds of precepts. Uh, so for bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, we have 227 precepts and 311 precepts, respectively. Uh, so um, the precepts are, uh, the first thing that needs to be understood is that uh, we translate this word as precept, but in Pali, there's actually two words which we use. Uh, so one word is sila, uh, and the word sila is sometimes translated more generally as morality. Uh, Sometimes it's specifically used to mean precept. Uh, for example, we talk about panchasila. That's commonly translated the five precepts. Uh, but the word sila, most literally, it means habit. Uh, it means a, a habitual behavior, a kind of behavior that we do over and over again. Uh, and the, so the other word that we commonly use when talking about precepts is sikapada. Uh, Sikapada is composed of the word sikha, which means training, and pada, which means path uh, or way. So sikapada means a, a path of training. Uh, a training, mm, mm, pada can also mean step. So sikapada, a, a training step. Uh, so a principle of training, a practice of training, a path of training. And it's important to emphasize for those who come from uh, Judeo-Christian backgrounds, that the precepts are not commandments. So precepts are not things which we've been ordered to do by a higher power. 
but rather these are ways of living which the Buddha described as helping us to cultivate wholesome states of mind, helping us to avoid harmful behaviors uh, and helping us to mm, cultivate the conditions uh, for mm, making progress along the path to awakening. Uh, so that's a brief introduction to the overall concept of, of precepts. Uh, Bhante, would you like to talk in a bit more detail? Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the Buddha calls precepts. And the first time I, I read this, it really impacted me um, because, you know, I, I was that typical Westerner who's coming from another tradition and think, oh, like they got, you know, rules here too, <laughs> you know, and um <clears throat> But the Buddha calls the five precepts, he says that they are ancient, unadulterated. It means like no wise person would ever say, no, these are stupid. These don't work. They're not, they're not worth doing, right? And he says that they're five faultless gifts to the world. And when I saw that, I thought, yeah, actually, you know what? That's right. They are gifts to the world. The Buddha says that when you do these, when you practice in such a way, you give a gift of fearlessness to all beings and you partake in that fearlessness as well. <clears throat> so in, in, you know, and think about this, I realize, okay, well, where's the Buddha going with this? So when, when you're not just killing whoever you want, sleeping with whoever you want, stealing from whoever you want, lying and drinking and doing all these things, then actually people are like, oh, this person's actually trustworthy. This person, like all these people, I don't know, they could all like, you know, stab me in the back, but this person has my back. I can put this person in my back and they, and they won't, you know, they won't harm me because they're following these precepts. I, that person has given me a gift of fearlessness. Right? And because that person gives that gift of fearlessness, then other beings, many other beings also like, oh, this is a good person. Right? I wouldn't want to do anything bad to this person or to harm this person. Right. So then when you are acting skillfully in the world, you actually partake from that skillfulness. It's, it's kind of like in the uh, the 11 benefits of metta. Right. When you practice lots of metta, you become dear to human beings. Right. When you practice, you know, living by virtuous principles, this is uh, something, you know, a benefit to yourself and others. <clears throat> Bhante G, my preceptor who, who ordained me, he said something uh, one time during a retreat that I always remember. Actually, I've stolen it because it's amazing and I think it's perfect. He says, what's the difference between a rule and a principle? He says, a rule is something imposed upon you from the outside, like a government or whatever, right? A principle is something that you take upon yourself. You choose, right? Sika Padang Samadhi can be translated as a training rule to be undertaken. Right? So when you take the five precepts, it's again, like as Bhante said, it's not something that's being, not even the monk is not giving it to you. It's like, okay, here's the five precepts and they throw it at you after you chant. No, <clears throat> you are taking it upon yourself. You are saying, I am going to train in not slaying beings. I'm going to train and not sleeping with whoever I want and you know, doing all these kind of bad things. So this is something that, um, you know, like I, I like to think of Sila, uh, uh, Bhante says habit, that is one way. There's a couple of different ways you can translate it. Um, I don't like, you know, as a Westerner, I, I kind of understand how a lot of people might not like the words morality or ethics. Um, I like to see it, think of it as virtue. That is another way to, so it's like you are choosing to live by virtuous principles. Right? It, it, it's like a calling, a calling to do good in the world, right? By your actions. So these, uh, at the very basic, the five pre the five precepts are already a gift to the world. And then when, if you add more precepts to that, it's an even bigger gift. <laughs> but the five precepts, precepts in and of themselves, just as a starting basis, um, is, is a very wonderful, very good thing for a person to undertake. Yeah, and, and I think it's also worth pointing out that the five precepts are basic universal principles of goodness, uh, which is why they're considered to be the basic foundation of Buddhist practice for everyone. 
So whether you're a lay person or a monastic, whether you're uh, meditating or not meditating, whether you're doing anything you want in the world, uh, as long as you follow these five precepts, then that will keep you from doing anything particularly harmful. And these five precepts are, are relevant to everyone. So anyone can follow these five precepts. Uh, so uh, again, just a brief reminder of the five precepts. So not killing any living being, which includes insects, uh, not stealing anything. So not taking something which isn't given to you, uh, not uh, engaging in sexual misconduct. So that means respecting the boundaries of consent and trust uh, in sexuality, uh, not telling deliberate lies uh, and not using intoxicants. So not ingesting alcohol or anything else that weakens one's mindfulness and self-restraint. Uh, so these are five basic principles of goodness, uh, which anyone can follow these. Uh, sometimes it means changing your job. Um, so if you have a job as a ex exterminator, for example, well, it's time to get a new job. Uh, or mm, if your job involves lying all the time, again, you might need to change how you work. Uh, so you might need to, to alter your, your livelihood a little bit. You might need to alter your lifestyle a bit. Uh, but there, there are things anyone can do. The longer list of precepts, so when you start getting into the eight precepts, the 10 precepts, the 227 or the 311 precepts, then a lot of those principles are not strictly morality or virtue, but rather they're tools for training the mind. So the five precepts are also, in addition to being fundamental moral principles, they're also tools for training the mind. Uh, but the, the extra precepts that one might take are, uh, especially the, the eight precepts and 10 precepts, the added rules are not moral principles. So for example, the sixth precept is not to eat afternoon. Now there's nothing evil about eating dinner. Uh, it's not inherently bad to eat dinner. Uh, but if one takes on the practice of not eating afternoon, then that begins to train the mind in renunciation. It trains the mind in contentment. Uh, it helps one to identify one's cravings for food uh, and start to identify the emotional states which underlie uh, food cravings. Uh, and it helps one to start to cultivate self-restraint uh, so that one is not uh, being constantly jerked, awa jerked around by one's uh, desires and, and cravings. Um, so there's nothing evil about eating dinner, but taking on a practice of not eating dinner is something which can help one to cultivate self-awareness uh, and self-restraint. So qualities of, of wisdom, uh, which lead one in the direction of awakening. Uh, but it must be done with that attitude. If one takes this precept thinking, um, dinner is evil, and by not eating dinner, I will automatically be more pure. Uh, if you take on the precept with that attitude, that's actually wrong view. Uh, in fact, that's sila bhatta paramasa, so the, the misunderstanding of, of precepts and practices, uh, which is actually an obstacle to awakening. So the precepts must be taken on with the correct understanding. Again, the five basic precepts, these actually are inherently purifying. These are things which do purify the mind simply by following them. But the longer lists of precepts are tools to aid in our training. They're not inherently purifying in and of themselves. So this distinction must be understood uh, if one is going to take on the eight precepts, the 10 precepts, or, or become a fully ordained monastic and follow hundreds of precepts. Uh, it needs to be understood that the precepts are not inherently purifying but rather they support us in our practice of uh, self-awareness and self-restraint. Uh, they help us to become more clearly aware of what's going on in our mind, uh, to be more clearly aware of our desires and attachments. And it gives us the tools to start to cut off those desires and, and attachments and to cultivate uh, renunciation and contentment in their place. Um, so is there a few thoughts? Would you like to speak a bit more on the topic of precepts? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else to add. Um, maybe do you want to talk in a bit more detail about the eight precepts or the 10 precepts? Hmm. Um, 
Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> in addition to the, uh, the eating, when, when you started mentioning the, the eating after 12, it reminded me of um, when the rule first came down and uh, that, you know, the Buddha is like, okay, no more eating after 12. And, and the one monk goes, but supper's the best meal of the day. <laughs> <laughs> like 2,500 years ago, this poor guy missing supper. That's pretty funny. But but yeah, as Ponte said, you know, even even most of the, you know, oh, I, don't, I guess I don't want to go because we're going to go to the monastery. But like uh, at this point, again, this these are not necessarily a moral thing. So for instance, one of the rules would be, uh, you know, the not wearing garlands, not wearing perfume, not going to plays, not going, you know, dancing and singing and things like that. Again, there's nothing immoral necessarily about that. There's nothing evil about that. But <clears throat> when we start getting into the higher precepts, we're talking about refinement and sensual um, refrain, refraining of the senses, right? So that we can have our senses be reined in and not be running all around as we try to um, live a more mentally secluded lifestyle, right? As we're trying to, you know, this is why the eight precepts are usually called the monastic precepts, right? These are things that almost always are, are done by people who go and stay in the monastery. Although sometimes on a posita, you know, people choose to do it for the day, which is also good or more as Bonte was saying. Um, and so the, that's what when you get into these higher ones, this is the same thing with the um, rule on uh, not, you know, sleeping in fancy beds. You know, people always, you know, say, Bonte, is this considered a fancy bed? Is that considered a fancy bed? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, uh, <clears throat> but this is, again, it, it's um, a rule about not indulging in sensual pleasures, right? It's a rule, even as a lay person taking the days, like, you know what? I'll sleep on a yoga mat or I'll sleep on a whatever, a little camping mat that has a little foam or something. Just like just to <clears throat> trying to train yourself in little ways to go without. Right. And, and so if this is a, a good practice for, you know, for short periods of time for lay people to kind of start training themselves in sense restraint training themselves in trying to set the conditions for the mind to become secluded so that you can go deeper in your meditation. Yeah. So uh, also just emphasizing that the, the more precepts one takes, the more the precepts start to highlight and counteract uh, one's defilements. Uh, so uh, again, uh, actually starting from the most basic, uh, Precept number one, not killing sentient beings. Uh, so a mosquito lands on you and anger arises in the mind. How dare this little monstrosity attack me? Uh, and there's the urge to kill the insect. Uh, so right there, uh, you're letting go. You're letting go of that, that urge to kill. And you become more aware uh, of your own hostility more aware of your own anger, more aware of your own resentment. Uh, and in this place, you can start to cultivate compassion. Uh, so caring about even the smallest and, and most obnoxious of sentient beings. Mosquitoes seem pretty universally hated. One of the most easiest, the easiest topics to use for this precept. Uh, actually, one of the issues in this area is uh, spotted lantern flies, so an invasive species that's been killing trees in, in this part of the country. Uh, so I remember actually somebody recently when I was talking about the precepts, uh, he said, and I was saying, you don't kill anything, not even insects. And he was like, what about spotted lantern flies? I thought we're supposed to kill those. Uh, apparently there was a public service announcement that you're supposed to kill spotted lantern flies on site. Well, Poor little buddy's just trying to live his own little life. Poor little guy. How would you feel if some giant came up and squashed you? You wouldn't be very happy about it, would you? And of course, they might tell you the justification. It's like, well, little buddy, I've decided to kill you because I think you're bad for the environment. You still wouldn't be very happy about it, would you? Uh, and he understood. The person was an eight-year-old boy, by the way. 
so he understood. He understood that actually even things like mosquitoes and uh, lanternflies uh, still have a right to life just as everybody else does. He hasn't learned yet that just because the government tells you to do it doesn't mean you should. <laughs> yes. Newsflash. Not all laws are moral. Problem. Uh, so, um, but when we get into things, so again, the five precepts are strictly moral principles. But something like not eating afternoon, again, there's nothing immoral about it, uh, but it helps to train you in identifying and weakening your defilements. Uh, or, uh, and even more so when we get into the precepts about entertainment. Uh, so dance, song, music, and shows. Uh, well, these are things which disturb the mind. They agitate the mind. They put the mind in a, a constant state of uh, vibration, which makes it very difficult for the mind to settle down. It makes it very difficult for the mind to become focused and concentrated. Uh, so in addition to uh, letting go of one's defilements, one's desires and attachments for entertainment, uh, it also helps to support one's samadhi practice. It helps to cultivate concentration because one's mind is, is more stable and settled. Uh, one of the common complaints that people make about uh, meditation practice is they say that when they try to meditate, they get music playing in their head. Uh, they hear repeats of songs in their head. Uh, you know how often that happens to me? Never. Because I don't listen to music. So if you don't listen to music, then there's no music bouncing around in your head when you meditate. It's actually really simple. Uh, it can take a few years for the echoes to fade away, by the way. So sometimes even if you haven't listened to music for years, you'll still occasionally get some echoes of a song appearing in your mind. But as time goes by, if you don't feed those echoes, then they'll fade away uh, and the mind will become increasingly silent. Uh, similarly, if you watch mm, some violent movies, you'll notice that afterwards, uh, your mind is, is twitching. Uh, your body might also be twitching, by the way, if you pay close attention, but you'll notice your mind is twitching. Uh, your mind has absorbed uh, the violence of the movie. Your mind has absorbed the, the constant frantic action of the movie. Uh, and then again, that makes it very hard to concentrate, makes it very hard to go into deep meditation. Uh, and the, the precepts about not beautifying the body. Uh, well, I'll tell you actually one thing, the precept about not using perfume. When you live in monasteries for a while, you become used to what humans smell like without perfume and it becomes perfectly normal. So it's just the ordinary scent of a human body. It's not gross, it's just perfectly normal. But then when somebody walks in the monastery with a gallon of perfume on, you can smell it a hundred meters away. You're just like, oh, sweet, Jesus, what a, what a, <laughs> why, why do they do these things? Uh, and what is considered a perfectly normal quantity of perfume in the rest of the world in a monastery is overpowering. Uh, so it, it actually really blows my mind. It's like outside of monasteries, people are in this constant state of, of stimu um, sensory overload, uh, which again is very disturbing to the mind. It's very challenging to study and focus the mind when you're constantly experiencing, experiencing sensory overload. And the precepts about beautification in general, they're ultimately they're about vanity. Uh, they're about inflating our sense of self-importance. Um, or if one has low self-esteem, they're often a crutch for bolstering one's low self-esteem. Uh, but in Buddhism, we're trying to get rid of both vanity and low self-esteem. Uh, we're trying to drop both the concept of inferiority and also the concept of superiority. Uh, we're trying to drop any concept of, of me altogether, in fact. Uh, so... A beautification has no place, uh, either as a way of showing off how great you are uh, or as a way of trying to cover up your low self-esteem. Self either way, it's irrelevant right, in Buddhist practice. Uh, we're trying to be totally okay with ourselves just as we are and to work on, on making progress towards awakening. When you're doing the eight precepts, <clears throat> you're, uh, 
you're being celibate, so you're n- you don't need to put on any kind of uh, perfumes or clothes or anything to attract a mate. So you don't need any of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> By the way, minor point on the eighth precept. So ucha sayana maha sayana. Um, so you'll sometimes see this translated as high and large beds, but in my opinion, that's too literal. Yes. Yeah. So ucha more literally means exalted, mm-hmm. uh, like something like really over the top. Uh, and maha means uh, grand or grandiose. Uh, again, something like really fancy. Um, so the point here is not necessarily literally about the height or size of the bed, um, but rather about how fancy and luxurious is the bed. Um, can I say anything else? No, I, I guess I would also say it's like a, I'm, I'm thinking of like the difference between the average person in India at the time probably slept on some pallet on the ground and like, you know, rich people probably had, you know, a decently higher bed off the ground too. So it could be that, but mostly I think you're right. I, I follow as you do that um, it's talking about like the richness and the, ex- the, the kind of the sensuousness of the bed, not like how high it is off the ground. Yeah, and uh, so and then we have uh, additional precepts. So for one who is, uh, again, um, progressing in monastic life, uh, then at some point one takes on the 10 precepts uh, where one also chooses not to use money, so not to be involved in receiving and using money. Um, but it needs to be understood that the role of that is within the context of becoming an alms mendicant. So becoming a, a renunciant who's living an extremely simple life and depending entirely upon the generosity of others. So it's not that money is inherently evil. In fact, there's many suttas where the Buddha talks about how to use money in a wholesome and proper way if one is not a monastic. Uh, But if one is a monastic, if one is is committed to living a simple renunciant lifestyle where one depends upon the generosity of others, uh, then the practice of not receiving and using money is a very powerful training tool. Um, but this one is is not for lay people. Uh, so I remember one time a while back, there was a person who was staying at the monastery. So just a layman staying at the monastery. Um, and and uh, one of the things when you're a lay person staying in the monastery is you might sometimes be asked to uh, buy things using the monastery account uh, to make purchases for the monastery. Um, and so this... That's just expected if you're a lay person staying in a monastery. Um, and one, and so one day this young person was asked to do this, so to make a purchase on behalf of the monastery using the monastery account, and he refused. And he said, well, I follow the precept of not using money. And it's like, no, no, you don't. Uh, that's a complete misunderstanding. Uh, so again, as I mentioned earlier, Um, Only the first five precepts are fundamentally moral principles. The rest are training tools which have to be taken on in the proper way, which have to be understood and applied in the proper way. Uh, So there's nothing inherently evil about money. There's nothing inherently impure or dirty about money. Uh, But rather, if one is committed to living a, a, a renunciant, mendicant, monastic lifestyle, Um, then not using money is a natural expression of that lifestyle. Uh, But as a lay person, it actually doesn't really make any sense at all. Uh, In fact, it just makes you, uh, makes it very difficult for you to live in society, very difficult for you to live a normal life of any sort. So if you actually really want to follow the precept of not using money, then you should just look into becoming a monastic. That's the only way it makes any sense. Um, I'm just thinking like, Maybe he must like live with his parents or something in the parents' spot. I mean, like, I don't like, how do you exist? Like you, you gotta get food. You gotta get like that. That would be, but yeah, you, you meet people like that who kind of have a diluted perspective. Like they're, they're just kind of trying to do something and it just doesn't really yeah, match reality, but it is what it is. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and then of course it's the same when one gets into the, the longer, lists of precepts that are followed by bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Uh, These are precepts which make sense if one is, in fact, a fully ordained monk. 
Um, but as a lay person, most of those, those precepts, they don't apply. Uh, and they don't make a whole lot of sense. And if you try to follow them, it's just going to make you a little bit weird. It's going to make your life very strange. Uh, so uh, it's, um, I mean, some of it is are things that can be practiced to some degree as lay people, but the, it's better to pull the overall principle, uh, the overall principle of renunciation, self-restraint, of living a simple life, uh, a life of contentment, uh, a life uh, built around cultivating wisdom and compassion rather than around uh, accumulation uh, and self-centeredness. Uh, so applying the general principles uh, while following the five precepts as a lay person. Um, anything else or should we look at if there's any questions or comments? I think we can go to questions. Okay, so uh, at this time we'll start looking at any questions that there might be here. So I see a few. Uh, Sud asks, is it true that one should follow precepts to not have remorse in the mind, which can act as a hindrance? If so, then is all regret the result of not following precepts in the past? What do you think? Um, I think remorse and regret have a valid, I mean, they exist for valid reasons. Um, you know, there you we, we do things that we have remorse and regret about. Um, what they're there for is to, is to kind of be a, like a messenger that says, well, don't do this again. Right. But the problem is when people don't process that and then let it go and move on. Like if you're just like, you do all kinds of bad stuff, like, oh, I don't care about remorse and regret. I'm just going to not worry about it. I'm just going to go through life. That's not good. Right. Cause you're just doing whatever you want, unskillful, causing all kinds of trouble. Um, but if you have, you know, you've done something bad, you make amends for it, you know, you try to be better, then it's okay. Oh, I don't need to be remorseful anymore. I don't need to regret it anymore. I've, this is part of my life. I've made amends. I'm trying to do better and I move forward. So it's, it's not about that. The remorse and regret are bad things. It's that when we aren't able to process them and let them go and, and move forward, that's when it, it can be bad. Yeah, I would also add to that that uh, so remorse and regret uh, related to uh, breaking the precepts. Uh, so there's also a danger of falling into a self view of thinking I am a bad person. Um, and that's also a trap because you're not a bad person. You're a person who made some bad choices in the past. There's a big distinction. Everyone has made bad choices in the past. That's nothing unique or special. But there's no such thing as bad people. There's only people who make bad choices. So you recognize, okay, I made some bad choices. I'm going to try not to do that again. And then you move forward, knowing that you have a commitment to, to being a good person, a commitment to uh, doing good deeds and not doing bad deeds. Uh, so that gives you a, a wholesome, positive self-esteem connected with one's commitment to a virtuous life. Um, and as for your question, is all regret the result of not following precepts? Not necessarily, uh, because there's a lot of unwholesome conduct which is not covered in the precepts. The five precepts are meant to be an absolute bare bones, basic minimum. Um, but you can do a lot of unwholesome things without breaking the five precepts. Uh, for example, divisive gossip. It might be completely true, so you're technically not telling lies. You're technically not breaking that precept but it's very unwholesome. And in fact, it's mentioned in the Noble Eightfold Path. So the more detailed explanation is in the Noble Eightfold Path. That's where you find a lot more information on how to cultivate a wholesome life. The five precepts are the very basic guidelines to avoid the most blatantly coarse, obvious kinds of misconduct. Uh, the Noble Eightfold Path is a more detailed guideline to living a wholesome life. Anything else on that one? Okay. No. And Frank says, what might the relationship between Sila and the Parami be? It seems like the precepts can fit under at least two of them, Dana and Nekama. Uh, to be honest, since the 10 Paramis is an apocryphal list, I can actually never remember them off the top of my head. I was going to say, you're probably better to answer that question <laughs> than me. So if you, know, yeah. if you can't answer it, then I can't. 
Um, although the Absolutely. although the ten paramis is a very popular list in Theravada Buddhism, you actually won't find it anywhere in the suttas. Um, the Buddha talks about each of the ten paramis separately on many occasions, but he never compiles them together into a single list. Um, that was done hundreds of years after the Buddha. So I actually, I, I would have to really think about it to try to come up with the list of the 10 paramis. Uh, so precepts fit under dana and nikama. Yeah, absolutely. So dana, the practice of generosity or giving. Uh, Bhante Jayasara spoke earlier about that. And nikama, renunciation, I spoke quite a bit about that as well. Uh, so definitely it fits under those two. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's also a practice of loving kindness and compassion. Seem to remember that's in the list of paramis. Yeah. Huh. Patience. Oh, beloved patience. Mm. Uh, where would we be without patience? Uh, well, I mean, I for one would have quit monastery life about 15 years ago without patience. Um, and that's another thing that precepts develop, but especially community life uh, is the absolute best training ground for patience. All the stories I could tell. Uh, I see some some oh, nods on this yes. one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, when you enter monastic community, one of two things will happen: either you develop patience, or you run away screaming. There's really no other option. Sometimes both. Um, but yeah, I mean, without knowing the the ten parami, I can't can't go into more detail on this question. Yeah, I would say that precepts is definitely letting go, right? Because you're letting go. Like, it's like, well, why can't I just kill wh whoever I want and sleep with whoever I want and take whatever I want? Or, no, no, that's like letting go. Like, you know, and obviously the, the, the average decent person is probably not doing most of that stuff already, but it's still, it, it's, it's a, um, it is a putting a border and, and letting go of the possibilities of doing that. So yes, it's it's letting go. Nekama. Okay, so uh, with the joys of the internet, I just pulled up a list of the ten paramis. Um, by the way, it's different in the the Mahayana canon. There's only six, oh. and it's a condensed version of this list. Oh. Hmm. Um, so the Theravada list. Um, so dana, uh, generosity that was mentioned. Sila, sila parami. Of course, that precepts fit under that. Nekama, renunciation. Panya is wisdom. Uh, yes, actually, as I mentioned earlier, the precepts are also a mirror for examining our own mind, for cultivating stronger self-awareness, and also an awareness of cause and effect, uh, of how making certain choices will produce corresponding results. So wisdom also can be developed through precept practice. See, virya parami, um, energy or, or effort, yeah. Uh, because one has to make a, an, an effort to follow the precepts, uh, requires uh, commitment. And especially when you get into the monastic precepts, uh, it requires a lot of, of effort and commitment. Kanti, patience, tolerance, yep, definitely. Satcha, truthfulness, yeah, that's under the fourth precept. Aditana, determination, yeah, actually committing to follow the precepts is an aditana. It's a resolution, a determination. Uh, metta, uh, yeah, I mentioned that already. Upeka, equanimity, yeah. Yeah, you need to have upeka. For example, when it's in the evening and you're hungry and you know you can't eat until after dawn the next day, well, upeka, equanimity, will get you through. So, yeah, actually, I would say that practicing the precepts helps with all 10 parami. That's good to know where it is, actually, the, the, in the Buddha Vangsa, which is one of the later parts of the Kudaka Nikaya. Yeah, the Buddha Vangsa appeared a few hundred years after the yeah. Buddha. Yeah. So for those who care and know, it's technique, it's not EBT, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Frank says, the issue is less one of morality and more of distraction when it comes to things like entertainment and beautification. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's a big part of it. It's avoiding distraction uh, and also avoiding things which fuel one's defilements. You're not going to get into jhanas if you keep thinking about the newest show on Netflix. Yeah. It's not going to work. Yeah. Or Amazon or wherever else they have these things. These whatever. Things. Whatever people do. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I remember when Amazon only sold books. Yeah. 
I remember when they only sold physical books and there was no free shipping. Huh? Long time ago. That's how old I am. Um, Jojo says, Westerners need to chill on the materialism. Everyone needs to chill on the materialism. Trust me, this is not solely a Western problem. Mm -hmm. It's pretty universally a worldwide problem. Um, and Jojo says, I really, really try. I'm mostly successful with the precepts. Great. I'm glad that you're mostly successful. That's uh, a lot better than not successful at all. So even if one only follows one of the five precepts, that's still tremendous. That's still a gigantic step in the right direction. So one advice which uh, is commonly given, uh, I've heard this in particularly in Thailand, if someone says, oh, I can't follow the five precepts, then the answer is, well, then just take one. Follow one of the precepts. Can you keep one precept for one week? And at the end of one week, if you successfully kept one precept, then take a second precept. And you can pick whichever one you get to decide. So maybe you really like telling lies, but you, you're pretty sure you can, you can give up on stealing things. Well, then take the one about stealing. I'm not going to steal anything for a week. Great. At the end of a week, if you did pretty well with that one, take on another one. Uh, and then keep that, those two for a while and then take on a third one. So in this way, you can slowly build up your precept practice and constantly praising yourself. This is another part of Buddhist practice. It's called sila nusati, uh, reminding yourself of your own virtue, reminding yourself of your own success in practicing the precepts. So actually at the end of every day, you can be like, wow, I didn't kill anything today. Good for me. That mosquito that tried to bite me this morning, I didn't kill it. Wow, awesome. Good for me. Uh, I didn't steal anything today. Good for me. And so on. And I think that um, this actually, what you just said, and this brings up the important point of intentionality. So for instance, say this is the other week, I told this homeless lady I didn't have the cash and immediately remembered after that I did. So that's not breaking, that's not telling a deliberate lie. That is unconsciously something came out and then later you realized it wasn't true. That's mm -hmm. different. However, <clears throat> this is something that like I started to notice, like when I started to realize, like I did never want to accept a lie that came into my mind. Like I, I always wanted to be truthful with myself. What I would notice is that I would say these kind of things all the time. And every time, you know, from that point on, I realized like if I do say, cause I tend to like exaggerate, like how many I'll, you know, I'll just say an extra number. Like I exaggerate. And so when I realized that I exaggerate, if I say something and then later realizes wrong, I'll go back to the person and clarify. I'll say, no, mm -hmm. this is so it's, you know, if you, if you kind of unintentionally told a lie, but then you realize later that you did, and then you still say, Oh, you know what? This still works to my benefit. I'm still, I'm just going to let it, I'm not going to do anything about it. Then you're choosing, you know, to lie and to be unskillful, but it, it has to be very important that this is an intentional thing. Like Bonte saying about, oh, I didn't kill anything today intentionally. I mean, you probably killed ants just walking and things like that, right? But you didn't intentionally seek to kill. You didn't intentionally seek to deceive, right? You didn't intentionally seek to steal, right? So intention is very important um, when we're talking about precepts. And Jojo continues, when I passed by her again, I gave her money. Oh, congratulations. I'm happy that you practiced generosity. And it says, am I going to the Peta realm or what? Uh, to be honest, only a Buddha can predict somebody's rebirth. So I would not even try to predict what your rebirth is going to be. Uh, I'm not, not that arrogant. He's, Did I transgress at all? Um, yeah, actually, I agree with Bhante J's assessment of the situation. If at the time you said it, you weren't actually thinking, I have money, but I'm going to tell her I don't have money because I want to lie about it. If that was your intent, then you would be breaking a precept. Um, but if you're just, she asked, do you have any money? And you're just like, no, uh, but there's no intent to deceive or lie, then you're technically not breaking the precept. Um, by the way, this is actually one of the easiest precepts when one is a monk. 
Because when beggars ask me for money, I can actually very honestly say I don't have any because I actually don't have any. In fact, I'll usually reply like, oh, no, actually in, in our tradition, we don't carry money or use money at all. Then you say, point the bird about, they're like, really? It's very strange. When they ask you, do you have any money? You say, do you have any food? <laughs> <laughs> One beggar to the other. Actually, when I was going into New York City, I used to go into New York City several times a week, and I had the practice of carrying um, energy bars. So I had something to give to beggars. Uh, so that's another thing you can do is deliberately bring like little gifts for homeless people. And I guess the, the, the whole thing about where you're going to be the next life, I, I think like it, it's a good thing for Buddhists to like, I, I don't, I don't want to go off the topic, but just like, I think it's a good thing for Buddhists to realize, like, unless you're a Sotipana, you might as well just roll the dice to figure out when you're going to be in your next life. Like, don't even try to bother with it. Just practice as, as good as you can now. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And Yudi says, uh, I assume this is in reference to the thing about killing the lantern flies. She says, I was reading that article today. I couldn't believe the government was telling us to kill. I don't know what you think governments are. <laughs> um, so they have this thing called the army and it's a group of people that the government tells to go out and kill other people. And they do this all the time. So killing is actually something the government does a lot. Yeah. And, and even the Buddha probably doesn't have an answer to if you could be a ruler and not have somebody kill. I think you see the mm -hmm. ruler sutta. Yeah, one yeah, of the Jataka uh, tales was where the Buddha was born a prince and he was watching his father and he realized that his father was always being put in positions where uh, as king he had to order the death and suffering of other people. So the, the, pr the prince, the Bodhisattva prince, um, pretended to be mentally ill uh, until eventually the father gave up and, and abandoned the, ch the child. Uh, so then the child got to, to grow up as a, not as a prince, so that he could avoid making bad karma. This is a past life of the Buddha, not yeah. the, this life. Yeah, the, past the, life. Yeah. Um, Christina says, how about distracting herself with social media? Actually, I know it's bad. So basically, I should refrain and endure the desire to use social media. Want to talk about social media? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, see, this is the thing. Social media can be a good thing if used skillfully and mindfully. Like, you know, there's, you know, like grandparents that get to see pictures of their grandkids across the country. And that, like, there's lots of good things on social media. There's, there's, we all post Dhamma on social media, right? Like there's, you can get all kinds of good things on social media. <clears throat> the thing, the, the important thing to understand is that the social media companies are have it, they, they basically want you to keep clicking, right? So you have to understand like that, you know, that they, everything's set up for you to keep clicking. So you have to be very mindful when you go on. Like, you know, it's kind of like, it, it reminds me of, I hated going to the mall and going shopping when I was younger. Like I go with my mom and my two sisters. I'm like, oh God, we're going to be here forever. And I would like, when I would go to the mall, I just go, okay, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in there and get it and get the heck out. And that's what I did. And that's what I do on social media. Like before I go on social media, I said, this is where I'm going on social media. And I go on and I get the heck out. If, and if, if I do it and I lose my mindfulness, I'm looking down somebody's wall and I'm like, and I'm like, well, what am I? And all of a sudden it dawns on me, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I bothering? So it's about being mindful and using it for skillful purposes. If you're just doom scrolling, like trying to think, oh, let me see what this uh, politician or these people are saying about this politician or that or this or whatever, there's nothing positive ever going to come out of that. Nothing positive. If, if because just like the, the the regular news, that the stuff that makes people angry is what is is what moves, right? That's the way it, that's the way it is. This is like years ago. I I tried to um I, I had this idea to make like a like a Twitter account that only posted good things that people did, um and like nobody cared about that. 
<laughs> people only, people want to like get excited by what the other side or the, you know this person or that person is doing. So d- social media is okay as long as it's done mindfully and done with a purpose. And you keep that purpose in mind and you bail out as soon as you can. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and if you lack the, the strength of will to use social media uh, in a wholesome, ref- restrained way, then actually you probably should just put it down entirely for a period of time. Um, so take a fast from social media for a week or a month, six months. Um, see how it feels. You might actually find it feels so good that you never go back. Or you might go back uh, with a renewed sense of focus and and purpose, as Bhante Jay was saying. Yeah, and there's, I know, but like even read the, the gentleman who helps me run my, the uh, disco community, he, he left Facebook years ago. He's not on Facebook. So th- there are people who just don't go on it. Better for them. And TJ says, how to control addictions such as alcohol? By going to an addiction treatment specialist. I am not one. Uh, so uh, alcohol addiction and, and other substance addictions, um, it really is best to get help from professionals for these things. There is Buddhist recovery places. To- there are. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a number of different um, Buddhism-based addiction recovery groups these days. So if you if that's what you want, it's there. Um, so just look around and see what resources are available. Yeah, this is important to keep in mind is that uh, most Buddhist monks are not addiction recovery specialists. So we can give generalized advice, um, but we generally can't give specific advice for something like addiction recovery. Uh, that's a bit, it requires a bit too specialized a skill set, uh, which I don't have. Um, a handful of Buddhist monks have that background and can talk about it in detail, but I'm not one of them. I don't think you are either. You never did addiction recovery. No, I mean, it was, you know, I taught, I, part of my job was dealing with something like that, but I wasn't the professional in that specific thing, no. Gotcha. Uh, Rick says, I have practiced celibacy almost 15 years. Congratulations. And I found this practice to be of great benefit to the development of the path. Do you have any reflections on how celibacy helps lay practice? Yeah, so through practicing celibacy, one is cultivating self-restraint, one is cultivating contentment, fewness of desires, one is letting go of um, sensual thirst, the craving for sensuality, Uh, one is cultivating uh, appreciation for a solitary life, a life which doesn't rely upon the company of others. Uh, So there's countless benefits. So this is an example of uh, following some of the monastic precepts as a lay person in a way which is supportive and beneficial. You definitely can practice celibacy as a lay person and it can be very fruitful. It's not common, um, but it's definitely uh, of benefit. And Anonymous asks, what techniques do monastics use to help deal with not sleeping very well? Asking this because one doesn't want to break the precept of taking marijuana products to help sleep sound through the night. Uh, Actually, the Buddha recommends practicing metta meditation uh, to help one sleep well. Practice metta meditation. Um, Another thing which helps a lot, by the way, is if you're lying in bed at night and you're having a hard time falling asleep, Just lie still and focus on your body. Uh, You can slowly scan your attention through the body from head to toe and back again. Um, Or you can just lie there and just focus on feeling your body. Uh, Or you can do metta meditation uh, or any any meditation technique actually. Uh, So if you're not able to fall asleep, well, that's fine. Uh, Then use the time to cultivate your meditation practice. And eventually you'll probably fall asleep. And even if you don't, well, then you spent the night meditating, which is great. Christina asks, by keeping the five precepts, do I reduce the chances of being born in the animal realm? Dante? Mm, um, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, th- this is, 
Again, the five precepts are the, are the basic. Uh, so like if you would have said like hell realm, I probably would have said a more enthusiastic yes. But animal realm is, you know, you, like Bonte said, you can follow the pre five precepts and still do, you know, there's plenty of other immoral or unethical things for you to do outside of the five precepts. Um, so what I would say is, um, you know, follow, follow the five precepts, do your best to follow the noble eightfold path and, uh, you know, develop the, the comma so that in future lives, you will go into the animal realm less. Remember, you already have un, untold numbers of lives with that can send you of comma that can send you to the animal realm as it is. Right. But if you choose, if you, you know, uh, practice as sincerely and honestly and strongly as possible in this life, then you're creating the comma of going to, uh, you know, becoming awakened or going to the heaven realms in the next life or life after that or whenever. And Rick says, I gave up playing video games in 2007. After playing racing video games, my mind and body were keyed up. I laughed at how they showed up and how I drove my own car. <laughs> Any comments on video games? Well, I think you actually already identified one of the issues here, which is that you, your, mind, your mind and body were keyed up. So there was a sense of agitation uh, in the body and mind. Um, and this is especially relevant with uh, fast-paced, uh, real-time video games, like racing games, as you mentioned. Of course, those are things which are going to generate adrenaline and agitation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so again, if somebody has a major problem with video games, then the recommendations I would make are, well, to start with, reduce. Uh, reduce the amount of time that you spend uh, playing video games. Um, also identify uh, what kinds of games have a more serious harmful effect on your mind uh, and try to cut those out. Uh, so uh, identifying what what is less harmful. Uh, if you're going to keep playing games, then at least let it be something which is less harmful to your, your mindfulness and uh, serenity. Uh, and of course, ultimately, it's it actually is best not, to not play games at all. Um, uh, there are language learning tools, uh, which can be very entertaining, uh, and which are actually uh, it appeals to the same uh, desire, uh, the same kind of desire, but it's actually something which is wholesome, something which is peaceful and which is uh, developing a useful skill in the world. Uh, so that's another way is you can find game-like activities uh, which are beneficial to one's development. Uh, again, like language learning tools or things of that sort um, as ways of, of nourishing that that same uh, activity of mind, but actually cultivating something wholesome instead of unwholesome. Any thoughts or should we keep going? No, you covered it pretty well. Um, Julie says, any advice for maintaining a sense of urgency to keep the eight precepts? Since it's a choice, it's easier for me to give into temptations like eating afternoon. Well, I would just say that uh, remember that one of the things we're developing by taking precepts is the quality of determination. So yeah, of course you, you want to eat something afternoon, I understand. But if you maintain your resolution, then your power of resolution becomes stronger. And in the future, it'll be easier for you to make and, and maintain resolutions. So that's one thing is remembering that um, keeping to your commitment helps to build up that strength of mind. Also, if you're doing the eight precepts for one day, it's only one day. Seriously, you can do anything for one day. You'll be fine. You know, I think uh, what I would add is since it's a choice, it's easier. Well, in a way, you, like think about it in, in this way, like since it's a choice, like you're choosing to do this. You could choose not to, but you choose to actually want to reflect on that. And also you could tell your mind that like, you know, like, like I remember in the early days of my monastic life, I was like, um, you know, reflecting on this and, and I said, and, you know, I came up with the thought, well, 
I chose to do this. Like, you know, and I could leave at any time. I could stop doing it. And when I would tell my mind that, my mom would be like, oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, let's keep going. Right? Like, so sometimes if you're like, you know, reflect on that, like, I'm, try I'm trying to do this good thing. If you like kind of reflect on that and kind of show your mind this and, you know, it's like, yeah, we could stop at any time. And then that could actually be like the mind could be like, you know what? Yeah, okay, we could stop at any time. Let's keep going. Let's try. Let's, let's you know, do it more. Um, so sometimes the mind is like wants that kind of way out in a way. Um, and if you, a lot of times, if you're sincere and serious about it and you say that, yeah, we could, we could not do it, but it's better for X, Y, and Z reasons why we do this. And the mind's like, okay, well, okay, let's keep going. Right. And you'll have less, you should have less problems because this is my mind. I mean, it could be different. I don't know. But oftentimes it's like, usually we feel when the mind feels like it doesn't have a choice in my mind that it like really lashes out and not wants to do things. Yeah. And so it says, how is not engaging in alcohol a moral precept? I have seen very upstanding individuals who might have a beer or two on the weekend and won't harm a fly. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, keeping four out of five precepts, keeping four precepts is actually really good. Um, but the fifth one is also very important because we're trying to cultivate and maintain mindfulness, self-restraint, uh, concentration, self-awareness. Uh, and these are all things which are reduced when one is intoxicated, even slightly. Uh, and uh, so it, it is it is advisable to avoid intoxicants uh, because these are cultivating the exact opposite qualities of mind. It cultivates uh, mindlessness. It cultivates heedlessness. It cultivates self-centeredness. Uh, it cultivates um, foolishness. Uh, so these are all things that we don't want to be introducing into our mind. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, yeah, you know, I, mean, I think obviously, you know, being Italian, the whole thing was, oh, we just have a glass of wine for dinner, something like that. That's very common. Um, and, you know, I mean, my mom and dad have a glass of wine for dinner my whole life. I saw them drunk maybe once in my whole life. Um, and that was just a, a rare, unique thing. So, yeah, you could say, oh, I, I just go my whole life. I just have one or two. Um, and, okay, that could be a valid argument. But if you think about it, the precepts in terms of, uh, renunciation of letting go, that is something that is, you know, that is something that can be like an actual practice of letting go. Maybe you're like, oh, I don't, I don't even kill bugs. I don't get, I don't steal. I don't do the, the rest of this stuff is easy, but I really like that, you know, beer every once in a while. Right. Well, then there's your chance to practice letting go. Right? For some other people, maybe they just like going around with the fly swatter like a general and just go killing bugs and doing all kinds of things or they like doing all kinds of things. And so other precepts might be harder for them to let go. Um, but if you think about it in terms of as a Buddhist person, I want to practice letting this go. I don't need this necessarily. Mm -hmm. And of course, you could say, well, you know, such and such study says like a little wine a day, you know, that, that can, uh, that's actually good for your health, you know, things like that. Um, and I, I've also seen other studies kind of debunking that or tell or saying things like, no, this, they're not taking into account X, Y, and Z. And so, but th that's the, you can observe the, you can observe the, the, um, the levels, the, the the links that the mind goes to justifying having something that you really don't need. You know, a few decades ago, they also used to say that smoking cigarettes was good for your health. Yeah. Uh, there used to be commercials on TV of like doctors saying that you should smoke cigarettes after every meal to help your digestion. And uh, at some point they realized that actually, no, these are really bad for you. But yeah, uh, another thing I would say is so, so let's say someone only has one or two drinks. So then ask yourself, is that producing any psychoactive effect at all? So is there any noticeable effect on your mind? Is your mind altered at all? And if the answer is yes, then that means you're experiencing intoxication and you should not have even that much. 
If the answer is no, then that means there's no difference between drinking a beer and say drinking a glass of fruit juice, uh, drinking a wine, uh, drinking some wine or, or drinking a kombucha. There's no difference. So you might as well just go with the non-alcoholic option since if you're really not feeling anything from one or two drinks of alcohol, well, then you might as well just not have any alcohol. So there really is absolutely no justification for it. Now, the justification is entirely coming from desire and attachment. It's not coming from any logic whatsoever. And Frank says, uh, it seems like the first three precepts could be kept even by a preschooler. Actually, all five of them can be kept even by a preschooler. And Frank says, I'm curious if this is part of introducing kids to the Dhamma in traditional countries. Yes, absolutely. From from like like two years old, they're like, okay, sadhu, sadhu to the, you know, and, and do the precepts. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a funny story that Bhante Ji always tells of uh, years and years ago when he was talking to uh, the Sri Lankan people and he was telling them about the five precepts. And this one, this little girl, like five year old or whatever, is listening and comes up to Bhante and says, My parents don't even follow the five precepts. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I follow the five precepts with my parents. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, and Jojo says, how do I have conversations with my friends and family without abusing speech? I already do a pretty good job at not lying. Congratulations. That's good. But I gossip, make jokes about everyone and everything and babble with them. Yeah. Stop doing that. <laughs> okay. That was easy. Next question. Um. Bill Stewart says, what are the thoughts about occasional tobacco use? So um, most Buddhist teachers that I've heard of um, do not classify tobacco as an intoxicant because it doesn't weaken one's mindfulness and self-restraint. So that's how we define an intoxicant. Um, that said, most Buddhist teachers also say that one should avoid tobacco use because it's harmful to your physical health. Uh, and also it fuels desire and attachment. So Any, anything that's addictive, yeah. And it looks like that's the last of the precepts, uh, the last of the questions about the precepts. Um, is there anything from the monastery residents, anything on this topic? No. I oh, think, you have a question? Yeah. Oh. Um, where do you draw the line of uh, in, in the precept of um, sexual misconduct? Mm. Um, hooking up, for example. Uh, basically, you can uh, be trusted to your partner, but if you're not, it's the end of society. So where, where is the line in all that? So in terms of the, three pre uh, the third precept, it's actually quite simple in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, consent uh, and um, uh, trust. So, if you're in a relationship with someone, then whatever the boundaries of that relationship are, then you follow those boundaries. So, for example, if you're in a committed monogamous relationship, then that means you don't have sex with anybody else. Uh, but you might be in a swinger relationship, in which case you've agreed with your partner that it's okay uh, to sleep with other people. So in that case, it would not be sexual misconduct because it's something which is completely agreed upon by the people in their relationship. Um, similarly, it's it's not required to be married uh, before sleeping with someone uh, in Buddhism. It's not a requirement. Um, but if you are already married to someone, then again, you're in a committed relationship and you need to respect the boundaries of that relationship. Um, so, uh, is there anything specific in your mind? I mean, basically most sexual behavior is okay as long as you have consent and you're not breaking any agreements. Well, and I would also add um, to go to the specific uh, set that the Buddha gives that the person has to be able to actually consent. So for yeah. the first part is um, one of the people not to have intercourse with is somebody who is protected by mother, father, or siblings. So this would be 
a minor. This would be somebody, maybe they have uh, like Down syndrome, they could be 40 years old, but maybe they have Down syndrome or something like that, where the, you, they can't really, um, you know, the consent might be iffy. So like you have to, and they have to be taken care of by their family. Like they, like those kind of like things are there. Um, so that so consent is also uh, making sure that it's people who can actually consent. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it is important to point out that the Buddha didn't say anything about the genders of the people involved. Um, so homosexuality, for example, in Buddhism, there's no problem. It's perfectly okay, as long as one is following the guidelines of consent and trust. Then it's totally okay. Um, well, I, I probably would add in that there are some issues in some types of Buddhism related to later things, but in terms yes. of the early stuff, no. Um, the, the one case which I know of for sure is in Tibetan Buddhism, there was a text produced about 1500 years after the Buddha, where it specifically forbids homosexuality and says that it's unwholesome. But this is 1500 years after the Buddha. Um, but that text is, is considered authoritative by many followers of Tibetan Buddhism. So you will sometimes encounter Tibetan Buddhist teachers who say that uh, homosexuality is wrong, but this is not something the Buddha ever said. It's something which appeared again, 1500 years later. It's not something that we find in the early teachings. And Frank says, does looking at pornography violate the precept about sexual restraint? Technically, no. Um, but you should ask yourself, why are you doing it? Uh, so again, as I mentioned earlier, the precepts, the five precepts in particular are just an absolute bare minimum to keep you from doing the most absolutely bad things. So there's a lot of things you can do which will nurture your defilements, but which are not technically breaking precepts. Uh, so technically, no, it's not breaking a precept. Uh, but if you're practicing Dhamma, then you do want to look, uh, what's going on here? Uh, what is this craving? What is this desire? What is this attachment? Um, yeah, if somebody is, an, if they're not celibate, so mostly people are not celibate, uh, then technically it's not breaking the rule about sexual misconduct. So no, it's technically not breaking a precept. Um, I've been a monk for a long time, so I don't normally think about these things. Um, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, if you look at the precept, it's it's all about your interactions with other people. Yeah. Right? So th this, would, th this would be, pornography is um, like feeding the fantasies in the mind really and so that's that's more related to if you're trying to develop like sensual restraint and things like that then yeah pornography and stuff's not good um but in terms of the sexual misconduct rule I, no that's not part of that it, i think it's important that we don't add because then you get into things like well homosexuality is sexual misconduct like people like to add all kinds of things but we should be very clear what's in the precept um, and, and not tend to add uh, all kinds of other things. Yeah, so I would say that if one is practicing celibacy, then you want to try to avoid things which increase the fires in your mind. Um, mm -hmm. So that would include things like pornography. If you're not living a celibate life, then it's not so important uh, to worry about these refinements. It's not really relevant to your life. I do know that it is a huge thing amongst young men these days of, of like fighting, going against pornography and, you know, all kinds of things like that. It seems to be a, a thing that's in the ethos of young men these days. So that's probably why that, that kind of question comes up. These days? I think that's been going on for the history of humanity. It's no, no, just no, easier I'm... these days. <laughs> No, I mean like that, like there's like really against pornography and against like all kinds of, you know, like stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting well, movement that's the happening. The difference now is that like you get exposed to pornography from a much younger age. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like you can be 10 years old with a smartphone and have access to all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have a smartphone when I was 10 years old. 
Okay, so we have a couple more questions here. So it says, is it true that you could follow five precepts perfectly, the 10 wholesome actions perfectly, and still end up in an animal realm? So again, uh, it's important to remember that your next rebirth is not determined only by what you do in this life. The Buddha is very clear on this, that we have a lot of residual karma from previous lives. Uh, and that contributes to determining what we're going to experience in the next life. So actually, yeah, the Buddha mentions, for example, that someone can be a completely morally perfect person in this life, but their next life can still be very unpleasant. And that's because of karma from previous lives, uh, which had not yet expressed its result. So this is one of the reasons why, as I mentioned earlier, it's not good to try to get into predicting rebirths because there's so many factors which we can't predict. Uh, what we do know is that if you do good things, you will get good results. And if you do bad things, you will get bad results. So only do good things and don't do bad things. That's all you really need to know. Think about like, think about having like, I don't know, what would you put like a, a bank account or something. And the good comma that you're doing now is being thrown into that account, but there's all kinds of stuff in there. And you know, when you die, the next life is just like, let's, let's shake it up and throw it out and see what lands. And, and that's the way it is, you know, um, until unless you become a stream enter. This is why my preceptor Bhante Ji would say, at the very least, try to become a stream enter in this life. Then you're assured money back guarantee, right? No more hell realms, no more animal realms, no more anything. At least try to become a stream enter. If you're not, if you're not a stream enter, then who knows what you can be in your next life? And you think about, well, in my past lives, I've been everything, right? You've been Mara. You've been in all the hell realm. You've done the whole tour of Sangsara. You've been there and you've done that. And until you become awakened, you're going to keep going there and keep doing that. Okay. And it looks like that's the last question. Uh, so maybe if there's nothing else. I just have one more. Um, in the other world, we say karma. Now that you bring it up, um, like what goes around comes around and uh, we say karma is a b like the b word so what is what is it is it real so if i do something bad today it's gonna follow me in this world eventually yeah i mean i think we're we're starting to get a little off topic here and if we start talking about karma we might be here for hours um but very briefly speaking uh, if you do good things you get good results um, and those good results might happen now, or it might happen later in this life, or it might happen in future lives. But it will inevitably happen. Um, so I'll say that much for now. If you want more, you can ask during monk chat tomorrow. Similarly, I see some questions about stream enterers. Again, it's off topic. So I think um, great questions, write them down and bring them to monk chat tomorrow. And we'll talk mm -hmm. all about stream entry and karma and, and anything else along those lines. So I think we'll go ahead and end at this point with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And we'll see you next time.